We're going to talk to Shape of God, pronouns he, him, calling in from Texas, says secularism is a form of faith. Uh, can I call you Shape? Is there a, a shorter name I can give you, or do you prefer <laughs> Shape of God? Also, how are you? Hello. Oh, we call him Sog. Oh, I'm sorry. That was by mistake. Uh, oh, okay. Sheep of God. I meant Sheep of God. It still would be oh, Sog. Oh, Sheep. Like still a lamb. Be, still is going to be Sog. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Yeah. I'm sog. Okay. All right, cool. Uh, well, and so uh, I'll, can I call you Sheep, or do you prefer anything else? Oh, I'm, my name is Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Okay, there cool. Uh, yeah. So uh, you say secularism is a we form of faith. What do you mean market. by that? We, we, yeah, I remember you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember you were you were the slave of Christ at that point, and now you're the sheep of God. Both of these sound <laughs> horrible, but I'm not going to get into that because I want to talk about your point here. You said that uh, secularism is a form of faith. What do you mean by that? Uh, let me start with the question, and I'll make an argument. Uh, so okay. my question is, uh, do, do you have a psychological knowledge? Psychological knowledge? Do you know, like psychology? Yeah. Do you have like, a tiny bit? Psychology? So when I was when I was getting my degree in education, I had to take a couple of psychology classes, but I would not call myself a psychologist, an expert in any way. But I know a thing yeah. or two about it enough to pass a couple of classes. I took one class uh, because there you go. I, I, I've been seeing this, uh, you know, atheist shows and stuff, and it has mm -hmm. it, it, it's been having a reverse effect on me. So the You've the more driven that closer see to faith because of us atheist shows. Yeah, yeah. The more that I see atheist shows, the more that I became more and more firm believer. I don't know why. That's just like weird. I don't know why either. When, when let me ask a question real quick. When you watched more atheist shows. <laughs> Was it like more evidence fell out of the sky onto your lap? Because I'm not really sure how, right? Like, how does it, how does that work? I don't get it. <laughs> no, in a sense that, you know, uh, I used to watch Matt a lot. And the more that he quotes the Bible and she, he, he's trying to show the errors in the Bible, the more I start reading the Bible. So the more that I, I know what, what my doctrine is. Interesting. So what do you mean by secularism as a yeah. form of faith? Oh, so a form of faith is like you have some beliefs and some principles. So you have like a common, uh, you know, moral ethics, basically, I think so. So what I, what I think is, for example, you know, the, in Christianity, even though Christians are different, they all like, uh, we all have like a same form of uh, not just dogmas, but also we have similar views on ethics. And most most people in the in the worldview of secularism have this common thing, and I think it's like a form of faith, because you know I, I think faith is like evidence for things which are not seen, and I think faith is evidence. I don't think faith is believing in something that's not necessarily visible, or I don't believe that faith is believing in something that you don't have evidence for. I believe is faith is evidence by itself. So uh, faith is evidence by itself. Is, okay, so let's let's address that then. Uh, this is something that I've said on the show before, and I'm happy to say it again. Uh, I'm here in my office right now, and over yeah. there in that corner, there is a closet, and inside that closet, there is a goblin. His name is Roland. He eats Subway sandwiches and he grants wishes when I he feels Roland. like it. I have complete faith in Roland, the closet goblin. Does that make him real? No, th that doesn't make him real, but that's faith. Is that evidence? Is that evidence that Roland is real? Could I not then say I have good, strong evidence in Roland because I have faith in him? Uh, okay, by the way, you're putting out, you know, two different things here. So no, what I mean putting, is, he's point, he's uh, I didn't explain out what I mean. Well, hold on, but hold on. It's important. You said faith like is that, evidence. He's pointing out the equivocation that you're making. Yeah, right? but, so. but you're, you're just making an example out of deception. That's deception. Believing in something that's not you, real. You said that that's faith different. is evidence. So if I have evidence in something, I then, you know, I, I or if I have faith in something, then I then have evidence for it. That's what you said just a minute ago. Did I mishear you? No, no, no. You, you're correct. You heard what, I, what you heard, but that's like false. Advice. So then what's the difference if I say I have strong faith in Roll in the Closet Goblin? Why is that not evidence? But if I say I have faith in God, that is evidence. What's the difference between those two things? Uh... Because what you just said, what you, uh, you know, you have a goblin, that's not scriptural, but 
having a faith in God. What if I read about him in a book? The scripture is evidence. Yeah, the, what the, if I read about him in a book? The only, copy, the only copy of that book is actually in my office. And so he is taking yeah. it from scripture. It's true. It's true. He's got the book about Roland and I read it. And that means it's scriptural and I have complete faith in him. Why does it break down? Why does that not work? I guess it's the same thing. I, I, I agree with you. I think uh, you mean it's like this doesn't necessarily mean it's superior than the other one that you're just making. No, it. I mean, a lot of sense. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm yeah. saying is just because you believe in something and just because you read it in a book and just because that book is very old and just because other people also like that book and just because the book or the belief or whatever brings meaning to your life or just because the book or the belief or whatever got you out of a bad situation or just because the book or the belief or whatever turned your life around when you were in a bad way, no matter what, none of that makes it true. The thing that makes a thing true, yep. is it being true? And if it were true, it would have actual evidence, something that I can test, something I can verify, something that we can all go look at. So for me to just say, I read about a book about this goblin, and now I believe in this goblin, and my life has changed because of this goblin. And the more shows I see that say that there are no goblins, the more I know for sure there's a goblin. Not one single bit of that actually means that there's a goblin in my closet. None of that is evidence. Okay. Uh, by the way, let me ask you a question. Do you well, think on, you're on, a on, body on, or on. do you think you are a body? That's a whole different topic, and I want to stick to what we're on yeah, right let's, now. Let's we can get to that, that later. Yeah, because what was just explained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, hold hold on, on, hold on. I agree with you, so I don't want to debate what you're saying. Hold on, real quick. When, when he gave, so let me like break this down, right? Because what we have is we have a belief, right? A belief in a proposition, right? A proposition like you think God exists or Roland the Goblin, right? There's a belief there. Now we can uh, parrot okay. everything that you that you use. Force can parrot it as well. And what this shows is that there's nothing actually justifying it, right? There's nothing justificatory for the actual proposition that gains us to knowledge. If me and you both agree that in order for our belief to become knowledge, we have to justify it, right? It has to be justified and it has to be true. I can't just guess and get, you know, I think... Uh, the U.S. will win today, or something, and then I'm wrong, or the, and then they're right. You know, they do win. Doesn't mean I had justification. It means I guessed. There's a huge distinction here that when you believe in a proposition, you have an attitude towards it, and you think it's true. But we're missing the next thing, which is something that justifies it, so we can count it as knowledge. And I'm not seeing how. Uh, well, let me just ask you: Do you agree that it's not enough to just have the belief and confidence in the belief or trust in the belief? to count it as knowledge. Would we agree on that? I agree with you. I completely agree. Yeah, I, I completely Great. agree, but that's not the point here. But the but point, I, I, what I'm trying to You can go ahead. Is, you can go ahead. You can go like ahead. But you guys I'm, this is, Sheet, this is important. Go ahead after this. This, when you say that, what you said is, I don't have anything that justifies the belief. Thus, when you call like your confidence faith as evidence, it's not that because it's not something that justifies it and you just accepted that. So we so now when you're talking about faith, clearly you're not talking about something that justifies the claim to be true, right? See, that's gonna that's this, this is gonna yeah, fall yeah. apart quickly because you're just admitting I don't have anything that justifies it. Yeah, but uh, you just you just made a presupposition and saying that you think God is a personal being, and God, according to the Christianity to do uh, doctrine, yes. is not even a personal yeah. being. You just said that. There's a supernatural force out there, and believing in that without enough evidence is not a good, you know, valid argument. Anything, but I never anything. made that argument. No, anything. Anything that you but, believe but in, you, you just believe in it. You need to justify the claim. You can't just say, the confidence I have in believing it, which is faith, right, just really trusting it and having a lot of confidence, that in and of itself isn't a justifier. That's the point. It is not a justifier. If that's the case, then Roland yeah. has a justifier. By parity of reasoning, yeah, let, Roland let, has let me give you an example. Yeah, let me give you an example. One time, mm. you know, I have experienced things that justified what I actually believed. You know, there were like a couple of times where I took the book and I, I read scripture and the power that was in that scripture actually um, became manifested in, in someone's life. And for example, let, let me give an example. One time, 
I was teaching from the book of Acts, right? Acts, church, uh, Acts chapter 2. It was in Mennonite church. I was not even in the United States at the time. I was in my home country. And uh, I actually, you know, I, I felt like, you know, laying hands on someone else. And that mm-hmm. someone got filled with the Holy Ghost. And after a week, so- uh, after a month, they told me that they saw the Lord, his face, and all of his image. So what do you feel about all the people who are Muslim, all the people who are Jewish, all the people who are Hindu, all the people who believe in indigenous tribal religions from around the world, all the other religions all around the world who have the exact same story as you? I was doing this sacred ceremony. I was reading from this scripture. I did this thing and it changed this person's life. They saw our God or gods. They they felt the exact same experiences like why is it that every other religion has the exact same story that you have? Oh, and naturalism. Don't forget me. And I went, also to, the, I went yeah. to the woods and I smoked a joint yep. and naturalism revealed yeah. itself to me in such a way that I can't be wrong. I had an, that, I had a yeah, naturalistic experience. For sure. So I can do that too. So you anyway, know, answer. What, what I think is all, all spirits, you know, are not from God. So they are like deceiving spirits and they're like a counterfeit where Satan uses like the same formula or the same power. As so well. how do you know that the, the one that you and your friend felt system. when you did this ceremony wasn't a counterfeit spirit? If all these other because religions have the exact same experience and they all feel the exact yeah. same thing, and that some of them are fake, how do you know that yours is not fake? Me, but yeah, because the, the mind did not contradict what apostles have preached. And the, all the other religions actually contradicted each one of them. For example, take Islam. They don't believe that God could manifest in the flesh. That's contrary to apostles' doctrine, the basics of Christianity. Yes, so and the apostles' God doctrine is contradictory to God. Islam, which means the apostles' doctrine is the counterfeit one because we all know that Islam is true, right? Yeah, but but they're not but but they're not authorized by God. They they're they're created by. It man. says in their it's book that they are man-made. Religion. It's scriptural. Yeah, but I, I I could write a book and say that this is uh, this is God speaking. That's different from uh, uh, exactly. Yes. you just hit the nail yes. on the head, dude. Woo. That's exactly right. Anybody can write a book and say anything about it, and it doesn't mean that it's true. And uh, if you had an experience, and ten billion other people had the same experience, and you say they're all wrong because my book says they're wrong, and they all say he's wrong because my book says they're wrong, you don't have a valid argument or a valid reason to believe what you're saying. You need actual evidence. Forrest, Forrest, you're not listening. You didn't <laughs> I'm listening to everything you said. I, I feel like... What uh, part of what you just said did I misrepresent? Like you misrepresented what I said. Okay. What exactly did I misrepresent? Okay. We both just had the same realization here's, here's at the same time. For no, for no good reason at all. Okay. We both were like, wait? <laughs> <laughs> that was just a coincidence. You're right. Okay. Here's what I think, right? So, you know, uh, I don't actually know what you actually believe. Whether you think like you didn't actually uh, address my question, you said that that's a different question. So I believe I I live in the body, right? I don't believe that I'm the body. I believe I live in a body. Oh right? man, yeah. So yeah I didn't address this because this is a totally okay. different conversation than what we were having. We were trying to talk okay. about faith and evidence, okay. and now and, you're going in a sheep, totally different direction. And sheep, we got to stick on a topic because there's other callers that are waiting, right? We don't want to go on six different topics. We stick to one. You can call back next week. This. I think you've admitted this is your second time talking on the, with us now. So we will go mm-hmm. through all these points. We're, we're here for as long as we're here. So I don't really, you know, see the point of uh, dodging the last thing, which pretty much showed that you don't have a justifier when you call faith uh, evidence or some type of justification. Someone else can parrot that same type of reasoning. And it seemed that you understood that towards the end, which is why we had the exact same realization uh, when mm-hmm. you spoke the words out of your mouth. That you were getting Yo. it, but, but you just equivocated. I would just go back over and listen to this conversation. Uh, I don't faith. know that we need to do anything else. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're, okay, but we're gonna go ahead and move on. Uh, but sheep, I appreciate you calling in again. We're gonna go and move on to the next caller because we got a lot of people waiting, and and I think we've we've kind of been through this this whole thing with you. If you want to call back another week and and talk to us again about whatever the other thing was, that's totally fine. 
but uh, we we can't have you know we've already been doing fifty minutes of this and we can't yeah. do any more. Um, it's a no gish uh, zone. Yeah, exactly. It's, man, <laughs> oh, I'm glad that you know it's, it, maybe maybe he'll go back and rewatch that call and listen to himself say that yeah but i have this book that says this thing which means i'm right and anybody can write anything in a book and maybe if he forgets that he's talking he'll be like that's bullshit because my <laughs> book says that. you know he gets stuck in a loop with him specifically uh well i think force you you almost requested this kind of call here but dan in oh, yeah. florida uh is saying abortion is murder which is just i mean uh, that's hey. factually wrong murder is a specific legal definition and abortion well, does not meet it. that legal definition but I'll go with the colloquial sense. Uh, Dan, welcome to the show. Hey, Dan. Hi, thank you. So, so what do you got for us? Hi, thank you. Uh, you may be technically technically correct in the legal sense. Um, oh, I am. Maybe I, I misunderstood the question, uh, but you know, my my thoughts are we protect uh, we protect all kinds of life, animals, and unborn turtles here in Florida are very um, protected and very sensitive, and I'm sensitive to all that. We developed a relationship with our three children before they were born. We heard their hearts. No, you didn't. We saw them. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Well, I'm sorry. I I felt like I did. Um, I know you felt like you did, but you didn't. The relationship is between two people. Um, So in in your your call screen thing. can hear me. So in your call screen thing, you mentioned that killing a bird in a nest or a newborn baby or anything that can't survive without care. Um, A newborn, uh, a a bird in a nest is not a pregnancy. A newborn baby is not a pregnancy. Anything that can't survive without care. Yes, I agree. That's a responsibility. And unborn turtles aren't a pregnancy. They're sitting in a nest. Um, What is your justification? I'm wondering for feeling like you get to force someone else to remain pregnant against their will. Uh, that's, that's a tough issue. I, I'll admit, and I, I believe in freedoms and I recognize that there are very, very tough circumstances where somebody should, should possibly decide that with the doctor and a lot of maybe counseling with the, the mom and dad. But my, my main concern is that we are losing respect for life in general, respect well, for each other. So, and let me. Ask I'm sorry to cut question. you off there, Dan. I just want to ask you when you because you 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 mentioned this uh, a minute ago. You said that we protect all life, and now you're saying we're losing respect for life. Which life are you talking about specifically? Because you can say a whole human being, but human beings need to eat to survive, and we're animals, so animals require killing other life forms in order to eat plants, other animals, fungi, you name it. Um, do you protect the bacteria? life whenever you sanitize your countertops before you cook do you protect the life whenever you brush your teeth and you knock out a bunch of chic cells those are human cells with human dna is that life that you need to protect like where do you draw the line on life you need to protect because just saying we need to protect life and we're losing the sanctity of life or none of those words make any sense those are just buzzwords that mean nothing I, I got you. I got you. Let me give you an example. When when uh, sure. a baby is first born, I, it gets into the rights of two living individuals, right? The the mother's there, and the doctor and the That's baby's true. born. I think the I think the line is if they're breathing and have a heartbeat is what it is. Uh, I, if I could be wrong about that, yeah. Okay. Could could I finish my question? By all means, I'm, I'm sorry. I I, okay. I just talked to somebody about this yesterday, and I think that was something that they came up with them. So I okay. just want to throw it in. Go for it. Yeah. When, when the when the mother. When the mother and dad are there, the doctor and the baby's first born, um, mm. does the mom have the right to kill the child or withhold medical care? That, no, the, no, because that would be something totally right different. The peer, her right that would be something totally different. To give than you're talking, pregnant. you're talking give, about give a it. child being. Hang on, you're talking about a child that is born, which is when it actually has rights. But when you say abortion is murder you're trying to create special rights for the fetus. And I don't even think even you think it's murder. So for example, if someone has an abortion in your ideal world where it's murder, what should the penalty be? Well, I I, I don't know about the semantics. If you want to get into- No, no, sir, Dan. Dan, this is not semantics. What is the penalty? What should the penalty be in your ideal world for murder? 
I really don't know the answer to that. I well, think that do you think there should be a penalty at all? I think. Do you think? Do you think murder think should be illegal? I'm trying to trying to answer your question. I, th I think it varies by circumstances. Um, do you think that there should be a penalty at all for abortion? So you is think that, murder in, in is only case. situationally wrong? Well, let me give you an example. If if God murders somebody, if, I didn't. No, no, God doesn't exist. I'm talking about human beings. Uh, I'm with you on that. What I'm saying no, is no, you're not. You're not with me murders. if your first response out of your mouth was if God murders, because murder is a legal construct involving <laughs> one person wrongfully shut up. Murder is a legal concept regarding one person wrongfully taking the life of another. Gods are irrelevant. All I was asking you is what in your perfect view should the penalty be for murder? Permanent imprisonment, a, a good scolding, um, capital punishment. What, which of those is, is better? Well, well, I was trying to answer if you'll let me finish a half a sentence. I tell you what, you pull some snarky shit like this again, you won't get to speak any further. Answer the I'm, question. I'm just, ask, I'm just saying even a god gets a pass on murder. It, it, if you believe in a god and you say it's okay to kill people to take Jericho... Dan, if we you bring up God, God and irrelevant things one more time and in, in your attempt to avoid answering the questions you've been asked, I will hang up on you. What in your perspective okay, I'm just saying, should I'm just the saying what what with, what in your perspective should the penalty be for murdering another human being? That's all I've asked. Okay, most rational people will agree with you. That it can vary based on the circumstances. If you're killing one person to save the life of 10 others, I would sacrifice my life. And I think I've heard you say this. You would give your kidney, your lung. Dan, just stop. Dan, Dan, you are incapable of honestly addressing this subject. You don't start. When I ask you what in your ideal circumstances should the penalty be? You started in with most rational people would, and then you describe circumstances where someone voluntarily gives up their life. That's not murder, Dan. I'm asking you, if You're one right. human being right. wrongfully in violation of the law kills another human being, what do you personally feel the penalty for that should be? If I cause the termination of your life to save 10 others, I'm not sure that would be the same penalty. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. You cannot honestly address this question, and I will be not be wasting my audience's time on you any further. This question was cool simple call. and straightforward. In that your personal so cool. opinion, that was it. In your personal opinion, if one person wrongfully murders another person, what should the penalty be? And then you just dodge and dodge and twist. Well, if I did it to save 10 people, uh, that's not relevant. That's not what murder is by definition. I didn't that was ask incredibly about your frustrating, motivation. man. I was excited for that call too. I was like, that could have been so awesome. We could have gotten into such great things. We we could have because here's the here's the thing, and this is why arguing with anti-choice individuals is so incredibly frustrating. Some of them want to say abortion is murder. Well, they're factually mm -hmm. wrong on whether or not abortion is legally murder in the United States right, right now. It may be in other countries. But if they say, if, but I'm willing to give up on that and say what you're saying is you feel that abortion should be considered murder, and I'm fine with that being your opinion. But then we have to look at what the consequences are, and so we ask, what should the penalty be for murder? Now, if you, there are some people who think the penalty for murder should be you get killed by the state. There are other people who think the penalty for murder should be life imprisonment. Whatever you think it is, what I find is that the people who want to say abortion is murder tend to have a different standard for one human being killing another human being than they do for one person terminating a pregnancy. Because abortion, by the way, is not killing. It is the termination of a pregnancy in its non-viable state. After that, it becomes a delivery because we have laws that actually do, despite Dan's uh, accusations to the, to the contrary, set up protections for fetuses. What we're doing though, is we're granting fetuses special rights that no other human being has because I don't have a right to use Forrest's liver. I don't have a right to use Arden's kidney. I don't have a right to use my mom's womb. Mm -hmm. And so why on earth would we give those same rights to something that's unborn, that yeah. isn't a person? Uh, oh, because it needs it. And most of the time, this is 
about trying to hold people responsible for sex as if the only way someone could possibly get pregnant is by carelessness through consensual yeah. sex. There are lots of different ways that people can get pregnant. Um, and this notion that, oh, well, we can just solve this by looking at biology. No, you can't, because the most we can do is probably say, hey, at what point does does the brain develop enough to the point where we would consider it, you know, like a conscious being yeah. in there? And as uh, a former friend of mine once pointed out, it doesn't matter if it's in there writing poetry and curing cancer, it still does not have the right to use your body without consent. And I would like to know where people get off saying, hey, we can get together and say, hey, we can force you to stay pregnant against your will. Because the dangerous thing that people need to remember is that the government that can force you to stay pregnant can also force you to get abortions. It, once you give up that bodily autonomy, it goes both ways. Get, uh, destroying bodily autonomy doesn't end abortion. What it ends is freedom. It guarantees yeah. that you are no longer sovereign over your body. It's the government that does so. That's it. You had a lot of great things there. And that, honestly, that's that's what I was expecting because I get asked all the time, like, well, as a biologist, like, when does life start? When can we say yeah. this is a human being? And it's like, dude, I can make a really good argument for and against life starting at fertilization, at implantation, at heartbeat, at breath, at what, at what wherever you, I can make an argument that life never really started because it started some almost 4 billion years ago and sperm and eggs are both alive and it's never really a thing, but none of that matters. 0% of that has any difference at all. Like you said, it doesn't matter if they're writing poetry and curing cancer, none of it matters at all. It's just, can I use someone else's body for my benefit? If, you know, my, my mother uh, has the same blood type as me and I need a blood transfusion and I plug a needle with a hose coming out into her arm and take her blood, she can pull that tube out and it would end my life. But that's her body to do that with. It wouldn't be murder in that case. Yeah. And what I always like to point to as well is, is uh, as far as legal or legality is concerned is organ donation. You have to sign off on that when you're alive. If I die and you need my heart to live and I didn't sign off on it, you don't get it. And now we're both dead. Yep. So you're telling me that if you have a uterus, you have less rights than a corpse. That's the best you've got. Like, uh, so frustrating, yo. Yeah. I'm it, mad it about is. that call. I'm mad about that call. I want more that actually make up for that now so we can get into it. I, I have no problem at all having discussion. I've done debates on abortion. I've had discussions on abortion. But um, I think, you know, I, I did a video a couple months ago called Answer the Fucking Question. Uh, <laughs> because the biggest problem that we have on the atheist experience and on other call-in shows and discussions and debates between atheists and secularists and humanists and liberals and progressives and, you know, right-wing, left-wing stuff is that if you go to the trouble to ask a question that is designed to simplify and clarify, it is incredibly unlikely that you're actually going to get a direct answer to that question. It does happen, yeah, you know, but it's very unlikely because by the time you get to the point where you're asking a question that simplifies and clarifies, that gets to the crux of it, somewhere in the back of people's heads, they're going to see, oh, if I answer this question and answer it honestly, it's going to lead to an outcome that's not going to favor me. And so mm -hmm. we get defense mechanisms um, where your brain starts putting up walls and you're like, but what about, but what about, but what about, but what about? Yeah. Um, Cause at that point, the argument isn't about who's right. It's about I'm winning, you know, and that's just, it blows. A call with substance. Let's see. We're going to see what Kevin's got going on. Kevin can do it. I believe in Kevin. Oh, Hi, no. Kevin. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Hey. Hey. Um, hey. You gave that much time to pie. Hi. <laughs> If you give that much time to uh, make fun of the last guy, you can give me uh, three minutes to read my uh, what I posted today about miracles and the proof of God. I do no, we're not going to have it. No, we don't. This isn't a negotiation. We're not having. We're not having a three minute speech right now. If what, you would like to have a making courtesy, what, what, right. what I know. <laughs> I mean, I, I demand What's that up? you must do this on your show. And for the record, he would have had significantly more time if any of that had made any sense. So, like, just yeah. start with making sense, and then we'll go from yeah. there. What would you like to talk about? Sure, I'll just start. Uh, I believe recorded miracles and near-death experiences, uh, many of which are witnessed by doctors, are the proof God exists. 
The reason why miracles are unexplained and cannot be reproduced is because God is the only one who can cause them to happen. The reason why there is no other physical proof of God is because God no, is he's a physical reading. being. He's not presenting he's anything. Yeah. That doesn't make for a fun conversation, Kevin. We're not here just to hear you rant for three minutes. Yeah, thank you. Oh, that was it. Well, I can do a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. That was okay. it. You said, you said that was it. What the, well, I could go. I could read another two paragraphs if you want. But yeah, I, I could sit and read the Bible to you. What, why would we want to do that? Just tell us what you believe in your own words. Posted in. I that is my own words. I just wrote this today on Facebook. Okay, can so you, you believe that God is the only person who can perform miracles, right? Like, so that's where you that's where you landed at the end there. So obviously, you believe miracles yeah. take place, and that they that and that the and the reason that they take place is because of God. So you are and and you believe that something like a near death experience is a miracle. Obviously, it's like am I understanding you correctly? There, thus far. Uh, yeah, people having out of body experiences and near death experiences when they can record what's going on around them outside of their body from a different perspective. What do you mean record? Of, you know, outside their body. They they can I take my they phone can, with me and record when they're dead and when they're dead on the, the hospital bed. They can tell mm. the doctors what they were talking about what was going on in the hospital room at the time of their death while they're outside their body observing this. What was well, they're not point? really dead, though, right? Like, because if they're if you're dead, you're dead. There's lo there's not like gradients of dead. There's other how, dead how is or not recorded. I, I got lost and recorded. You said they can record things out of their body. What did they record with? No, the no, no, no. They can't. That's another part of it. They, we we can't use instruments to record God or the spiritual world because our instruments are made for this potentiality. We can't have instruments. Wait, are this. you saying that you were in error by using the word record, yeah. and I should just move on from that? Yeah. Yes. She, the people who are having NDE, who are dead outside of their bodies, still alive in their spiritual body, can record and tell you what happened at the time. What are they recording they with? They were dead on. Well, they can. Is, just, is, I'm just saying they can. I use the wrong is English word. English first language, language, Kevin. I, I want to make sure before I. I think he means like recount, like they can recall like can, and then remember, articulate. Recall? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's what I think he means. Okay, so you you don't mean record then? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's carry on. Yeah. So they can they can testify what their experience is. So they if you ask them, they can say I had X experience. Is that that's kind of what you mean? Right. Yeah. Or I I I feel like I saw this. I heard this. I felt this. Those sorts of things. Right. They remember being in their spiritual astral body outside okay. of their physical bodies while watching what the doctors are doing and saying while they're resuscitating them. Okay. All right. So I, I'm with you on that. Now, is it, is it possible that that experience um, that they're having, like, are you willing to entertain the possibility that that experience that they had, that perceptual experience wasn't actually them outside of their physical body? Um. I mean, you could put, yeah, you could say it's a chemical reaction in their brain making them uh, have psychosis or whatnot, but. No, 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 no. Okay. No, no. I'm, I'm going to, the, the brain scientist in me is having a nervous breakdown right now because you can't, <laughs> psychosis is not. That's something else. Like, that's dramatically different. So we're just, we're talking about perceptual anomalies, right? So we're talking about people having perceptual anomalies while they're in an unconscious state. That's not psychosis. It's not uncommon. It's basically what a dream is. Um, the only difference is when somebody has a near death experience. And I think you also conflated several terms as well, because you said they are dead and they come back to life. There is no coming back to life once you're dead. Otherwise resurrections would be commonplace and Jesus wouldn't be so freaking special, right? Like you're either dead or you're not dead. So and then your other conflation in terms is saying that people are having out of body experiences when they haven't even flatlined, which is, I think, what you're talking to, um, which isn't actual death. Actual death is the prevention of sodium and ion transmission across the nucleic cell membrane in the neurons in your brain. Um, that's actual, real, legitimate death. Like there's no coming back from that. Um, so when they're on the operating table, that's a different type of what you would call near death experience. Like there's like, the, there's a, there is a gradient of what people would consider those to be like in the circumstances where they take place and almost all circumstances where they take place though, there is no sort of 
cooperation. There's folklore about this sort of cooperation that if if you dig into it, you really can't find it being substantiated in any sort of real and meaningful way. It's not really repeatable. And it's... I beg your pardon? It's impossible. You can't reproduce something that happens spiritually that happens miraculously. Right? Well, you're just assuming, oh, <laughs> Kevin, you're just assuming, you're just asserting that it's happening yeah. miraculously. Yeah. There's mundane explanations for these types of brain events, right? So if you're, if you're, there, there are though, there, there really and legitimately are mundane explanations for these types of brain events. Um, I'm a proponent of it that like, there's a there, there's a receptor in your brain that's on most of your neurons and it's called sigma six and the sigma six receptor is this, it and people may argue with me on the minutia of this from a neuroscience perspective but i think that this makes sense like if there's a chemical that's endogenous in your system that's called dmt and some people call it like the spirit chemical or whatever but it actually helps to um fluctuate um, the allow allowing oxygen in and out of your neurons. So it's just something that in our system allows oxygen in and out of our uh, out of our neuronal cells. So if and it's also an hallucinogen. It's both of those things. It does both of those things, um, and it's produced in just really small quantities generally. But if you have oxygen deprivation, in order to to prevent something called apoxia, and apoxia is when your cells no longer have enough oxygen to stay alive, um, a little bit more DMT is produced in your sigma six receptors start to suck the DMT in a little bit more as part of a survival mechanism. And because DMT is a natural hallucinogen, when your sigma-6 receptors are, receptors are attempting to prevent cell hypoxia in your neurons, um, they will start to take the DMT in order to regulate, to prevent that hypoxia, which can cause a hallucinogenic experience. And that hallucinogenic experience from a perceptual perspective like perspective can seem exceptionally like real. Um, so that's a mundane explanation from a neuroscience perspective that accounts for everything that you've just said without you providing external cooperation. So you're, you're just asserting at this point that it's some sort of magic spirit thing based on things that you've heard that seem to affirm what you already believe and sound cool to you without actually looking into the science of what brains do. We, uh, all these chemical reactions you're talking about are randomness, right? We <laughs> Whoa! Wow. No, they're not. Oh my god, they're incredibly regulated. Are you kidding? They're not I random mean, at all. We need to go back <laughs> two minutes because everything you just said got ignored. Cold hard. Uh, it's not random. Amazing. It's you, like we you can I'm predict impressed. it. <laughs> I'm Kevin, I'm impressed. That that was the most good, then if it's not random. The greatest lack of understanding of what was just said to you, I, I think I may have ever heard on the show. Oh, man. Okay. But it's not random, though. Like, the, it's... Comprehensive it's <laughs> conscious, comprehensive experiences. This isn't just some oops in their brain. Doctors have these experiences, have had these and these ease their, themselves when their brain dead, heart stopped. This person... I'm so... Awareness. Yeah. They're having awareness. I don't know that you necessarily heard what uh, anything about like I'm giving you an actual physiological explanation for these types of experiences that people have that seem like very vivid and lucid and real for those people. And there's a physiological explanation. I mean, and it's one of many, like that's just one of many explanations. It's one that I think makes a great deal of sense. And I'm sure there may be even some some neuroscientists that kind of disagree with me on that. But to me, it makes a lot of sense because epoxy is something that happens when you go through oxygen deprivation and those receptors would become more active and a chemical that and it yeah. I just I'm it just it, it, it makes it sense. Yeah. <laughs> Science Kevin, can Kevin you, you brought the word miracle. Can you define a miracle? A miracle is when something happens that we can't explain and understand or detect why it happened. But like I explained so, it. You know, we well, I, I'm just, it's it. curious because it, so miracles only happen no, no, when no. you're ignorant. Is that what you just said? Uh, well, yeah, we're very ignorant human beings, aren't we? Okay, okay. We don't know so, I mean, I'm, I'm a, that's the first thing we've agreed on, I think. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. absence of knowledge is part of the definition of what a miracle is. That's the ground you want to stand on. 
when things have at this point, it's a yes, or, I meant it as a yes or no, Kevin. I mean, it just it, is that uh, you said it. I just I'm double checking because I'm going somewhere with this. You're saying that your lack of understanding of something that happened is part of what makes something a miracle. Doctors, if that's PhD is highly. <laughs> that's, we can't he can't answer the question because the you're, problem uh, is that if that's your position that you stated, I'm just taking your words. If that's your position then miracles are more likely to happen the more ignorant you are. And I don't mean stupid, just ignorant. Uh, uh, if you're ill-informed, you don't have the information, you don't know how the sun comes up in the morning, you don't know why the moon has a light. If you're ignorant, the more things you're ignorant of, based on your definition, the more likely you are going to see a miracle. I, I just think that's a, a not a good place to be. Well, you think we're going to explain miracles one day when uh, we get more technology or... We don't think that miracles happen. I think that that maybe that's a disconnect. We don't but think Kevin, miracles are. We think that there's explanations for things that we attribute as miracles. Th thanks for uh, confirming that what I said was correct, because your uh, follow up was not addressing anything that I said, but reaffirming. Oh, maybe someday when we know more things, we'll show that miracles didn't happen. Yeah, when we know things, miracles don't happen. You, you think, but it was your definition. Uh, you know, it's like. It's another thing like spirit, like uh, uh, psychics and mediums. You know, there's so much evidence of spirituality. So many. Wow, you think psychics are real? That's mediums that's not real? good evidence. Like you and I have different standards of evidence, evidently, like just drastically and dramatically different standards and, of evidence. It's the most amazing thing for me to hear that, that no someone is converting evidence. or uh, co comparing their religious experience to a psychic or a medium. That's profound. That that's the that's the level of evidence you need to believe that something is real is way lower than the average person. The only way we can detect God is with our minds, with our consciousness, because that's the only way God exists. Like He doesn't. That's the only way we can detect anything, though. It's so, <laughs> like, literally the only someone, way we can detect anything. If someone thinks God is real and they die. Does God die too? Because you just said He only exists in the mind. Hey, well. I I believe the New Testament is literal, and it is verifiable. Literal. That is a hard right turn. Hard right turn. Literal? It's literal? The definitions of how we should beat our slaves are, are literal. The, the fact that you should leave your family and sell your goods and, and even sell your clothes and buy a sword so you can follow yeah. Jesus, who doesn't bring uh, peace and joy. He brings a, a sword and he separates families. You think all of that is, first of all, literal, and then I'm assuming you think that shit's a good idea. That we should sell our clothes and buy a sword. That's where you're going. You got to take it, put it in context. You got to take this in context. <laughs> it's always in context. Did, did Jesus make water into wine? It is always in context. Well, I don't know. Do you want to get a buzz on with dinner? Or are you going to drink water or wine? You got to put things in context. Yeah. Like, come on. Okay, Kevin. All right. Yeah, all right. I, I, think we're, I think we're done now. Like, just think about what I said. Maybe listen back because I think it does explain what you're potential evidence was like with using a mundane explanation for something that you're attributing as a miracle that is just you know a common occurrence yeah. given what we understand about brain chemistry Standing. i'm gonna let you go though thank you kevin yeah. have a delightful delightful afternoon I, evening I whatever feel, time it is for you i feel bad <sighs> for christians that that these are your representatives these, these are the people that have come forth to try to explain something and i'm i I don't know. I, I think the guy in the street corner with a, a, a billboard and a giant cat, a Christian flag is going to be more rational than the callers we've had today. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I feel bad for the average uh, believer that that's just pretty amazing. Well, pronouns are he, him, and wants to tell us about the historical events. Here we go. Uh, in the Bible that he claims have been proven true. So welcome, Charles. How are you? Okay. How about you? Uh, I'm alive. Fine. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, the the proof I have is, you know, Ron Wyatt. Uh, he found the ark. He found the, the red sea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Charles, but Ron Wyatt is a big old fraud, and that's been demonstrated over and over again. You, you're either joking, um, which I hope you are, because that's funny. Or you've bought into a, a bunch of nonsense biblical archaeology from from the biggest fraud on the planet with regard to proving Bible stuff. 
So the second Ron Wyatt comes out of your mouth, nobody, nobody with any sense is going to take you seriously. Please tell me you're joking. Why would any, why would anybody think that he's a fraud? The guy made no profit from what he did. Okay. That's not true. His own that's not, I, I mean, that's absolutely not true, but you don't have to make a profit to be a fraud. He's, his findings have been demonstrated as fraudulent. And which, which findings are those? He didn't find Noah's Ark. There's no evidence that there is a Noah's Ark. Uh, the, the wheels underneath the Red Sea and other findings from him. I mean, if you just go Google Ron Wyatt fraud, you will find the explanations. I don't have either anywhere near the time to explain to you all the ways in which Ron Wyatt was wrong. But it's such a joke that, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if it's not listed in his Wikipedia entry. Well, you know, I mean, uh, you know, all I could say is, you know, you find you find a big boat on an elevated. Of, he didn't find a big boat with. Uh, well, I mean, what is it then? He didn't find a boat. Is, uh, what he you're found talking a rock about that looks like a boat. What? <laughs> what is here? Here, let me make this really easy, Charles. Charles. What is your ex? What, Charles? What is your evidence that he found anything ever? Well, there's a, there's Turkey has has a a big um, national park that they put up right there where where uh, Ron Wyatt found the ark. Uh, why would they do that? So they could make I mean, money. They, they, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> from from the gullible. But nevertheless, you know, I mean, it's it's you know, I mean, there's 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 a big huge. Uh, structured there, there in in that location. Okay, uh, it had it had um, you know metal in it that was uh, you know only invented like 50, 60 years ago, um, and you know the, uh, what. How so hang on, hang on, hang yeah. on. Did you just say that it has that that this ancient thing has metal in it that was only invented fifty or sixty years ago? Yeah, it, it had it had rivets that that held it together. And it was so uh, clearly it's not old then. And so clearly it's not old then if it has metal that was only invented fifty or sixty years ago. Clearly, I mean, no. If you if you find if you find an ancient uh, you know structure in the ground with uh, metal that's uh, you know that's that's only been developed a few few hundred years or sixty years ago, um, you know you'd have to you'd have to how how would that even be remotely possible. How would that be, be even remotely possible to have, um, say, a mo a modern steel in something that is as theoretically old as as the Ark is? How is that possible? Exactly my point. How is it possible? You know. Okay. Well, the, the answer we're, is we're, it's we're not. We're going to move on, Charles, because <laughs> I mean, so seriously, I've been hosting this show for seventeen plus years. Um, any quick. All right, well, and, and, right, well, and even and even I'm I'm still yeah. talking. Then, let, uh, let, any okay. any quick Google search will show you that Ron Wyatt's findings uh, have been questioned, verified, and or debunked. And you seem to just run with all of it, like, oh, we found something in Turkey, and it had a metal that's only been developed in the last 56 years. Um, submit a paper and get it actually uh, confirmed by any scientific journal anywhere on the planet, because right now what you're doing is you're just spreading rumors that have been knocked down for decades. Uh, so my my boat that I, I own and live on currently is a wooden boat. It has not a single metal rivet in it. It's not riveted at all. It is not put together with rivets. So why would a boat built in 1985 out of wood not have rivets in it? How was it built in 1980? Oh, your boat was 1985. My boat was built in 1985. Is it is a wooden boat. Your, it's mahogany ply. Your boat isn't so huge that it has to be put together, you know, in a special way. Now, that is it? You know, um, it, it's put it's put it's put together pretty close to the exact same way wooden boats have always been put together. Uh, yeah, the, the primary difference is is, is the huge. the glues and some other things are more modern and therefore some uh, significantly better than previous. But boat building, uh, wooden boat building, is a skill that has been passed down for centuries. And guess how many of those boats have metal rivets in them? And this includes, oh, by the way, Spanish galleons, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I know. That's, that's so why why are none of those boats put together with metal rivets? What's the reason? I have no idea. 
I'm just telling ah. you, this one had rivets in it. Because it doesn't work. <laughs> you have a very, very hard substance that's going to be in contact with a much softer substance. And as the boat flexes in three dimensions over the waves, guess what's happening with that metal and wood? Have you ever taken uh, a piece of metal and dug around in, in a, a piece of wood? It would flex, I agree. I don't know. No, it would. It doesn't flake. Yeah. You know what it does? It widens out the hole. You know what we call that in the boating world? A submarine. Yeah, it's a submarine. It leaks. It's simply not possible for a metal rivet to be in a wooden boat because if it was, we'd be using them all over the place and we don't see it being used anywhere on any circumstances because it's a hard substance against a soft substance and boats flex in three dimensions. And they flex a lot, especially earlier boats. That's how they got over the seas. So your claim that metal, I don't care when the metal was made, right? And well, actually, I do. Let me let me let me walk that statement back. I'll tell you why. See, a metal made 60 years ago puts you in the in the realm of some really really hard metals like modern steels. You can't make. Uh, easily without the Bessemer process or something like that. And those are very, very hard. So something in the last 50, 60 years is going to be an alloy of some kind that is even harder. So guess what it's going to do? It's going to make bigger leaks. It's simply not Let, possible. Let's 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 back this up and make it really easy for Charles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Charles, if you go out and do research, what you'll find is that the thing that Ron Wyatt supposedly found in Turkey uh, does not match up with the biblical account at all. The things that were iron brackets were um, a, basically a version of hydrated iron oxide. Um, there's no fossilized wood or traces of wood, reed or elemental carbons associated with the structure. The structure itself there is consistent with um, a, a regular geological history. And it's incompatible with what the Bible says about the floodwaters lowing because the site is 10,000 feet lower than the summit of the nearby mountain. Now, but let's set all of that aside and say that on top of a mountain, somebody found a boat like structure that seems to match some aspects of what's reported in the Bible. Does that mean we conclude, can conclude that there was a global flood? Does it mean we can conclude that that boat is the boat in the story? Does it mean we can conclude, conclude that there's a God? The answer to those three questions is no. That's straight up easy. Well, I mean, no. As far as far as it, you know, how does a huge how does a huge boat like that get up get up to a high a high place like that? So uh, first of all, you you, yeah. you don't know. Blood. You don't know it's a boat. You don't know how it got there. But no matter what the no matter what we the question is, is that sufficient to demonstrate that a god exists? That a global flood happened? That that, that that's Noah's Ark. Well, I'm not saying, uh, you know, all I'm telling you is there's there's evidence out there for... I didn't ask you to tell me. I asked a question. Yeah. Is that sufficient evidence to conclude that there's a God? No, it isn't. Then why did you bring it up as if it were evidence to conclude that there's a God? Because I'm looking at the evidence as a whole, okay? I'm not looking at the evidence of one particular uh thing in the bible but the one particular the first thing you pointed out is completely irrelevant and broken it cannot do the thing that you could I mean, so we asked you to demonstrate that a god exists and you start with a fraudulent bs archaeologist with with no real credentials who's been debunked left and right and claim ah he found noah's ark no he didn't you said he found Noah's Ark, and now you're admitting that there's no way to know it's Noah's Ark, which means you lied earlier. No, I didn't say there's no way to know that it's Noah's Ark. I, you know, if, I did. I just asked you, is there any way to demonstrate that that's Noah's Ark, and you acknowledge that the answer was no. How can you How can you demonstrate that that, that structure that he found is Noah's Ark? No, um, what's that? How do you demonstrate that the structure that Wyatt supposedly found is Noah's Ark? Well, it, it looks like a boat. It's the same dimension. Oh, my God. Charles, you cannot be this stupid. 
How do you demonstrate that this is actually no, is it possible for you or anybody else to demonstrate that the structure on that mountain is in fact Noah's Ark? You know, if you, if you have a huge structure on, on, in, in a mountain range. Charles, why won't you answer the question that I've asked you? Is it possible for is, you or anyone else to demonstrate that the structure found on that mountain is in fact Noah's Ark? I've already said no to that, to that question. Then you were lying before, and then you lied again when I told you that you were lying about it because you don't get to call it Noah's Ark, and you don't get to say it was Noah's Ark, and then acknowledge, as you've done twice now, that there's no way to demonstrate that it is Noah's Ark. Why are you lying for Jesus? All I can say is, okay, if, if, it, if, you, look at, if you look at something, okay, and it, it matches up with the evidence at hand, okay, uh, sometimes you just have to look at somebody, something, and, and look at it logically and say, you know, this has got to be it, okay? And then when you take 10, 20, 30 things from the Bible and look at, look at the historical events through, through, through time, okay, and, uh, you know, pull these things up out of the ground, uh, sooner or later, you, you know, you, you can take all of them together and make, make a determination. Okay, I'm not so the, the, the style of argument you're making, the yeah. problem with the style of the argument you're making is I can make, use everything you just said to prove Spider-Man exists in New York. I can do everything you just said, I can do that with. Now, really how? Do you find webs all over? The, the, you know, I mean, uh, you know. No, we find, we find them. Uh, yeah, they're webs biodegradable. biodegradable. Did, did Ron Wyatt find any animal skeletons near that boat structure? Nope. No. Did, did, did they find any petrified waste products or anything? Did they find anything that was wood? Nope. You found, no. Well, it, it was petrified wood. No, 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 actually. See, this is the thing, Charles, is that you don't have any knowledge. You don't have any firsthand knowledge. You don't have any expertise. And when, you, when you're asked about how you would demonstrate this is true, what, what your argument boils down to is, well, when you look around at the world and you start seeing some things that line up with an ancient book, I'll just go ahead and say that the ancient book is right. Well, I'm sorry, but that is fallacious reasoning. I went to his uh, museum in Tennessee, okay? I, I held a piece of the wood. It's not a museum. It's a con, but go ahead. Whatever, you know, I mean, you know, whatever you think, you know, I mean, have you been there? How do you know it's a con? You know, um, you know, so, you know, I mean. Because I've studied up on this for more than the last 20 years. Um, and, and, and instead of just going with what Ron Wyatt supposedly reported and what the Wyatt family is trying to make money off, did you pay money to get into that museum there, Charles? As a matter of fact, I didn't, no. Did I, you make a donation? I didn't give them a thing. Okay. Well, cool. Congrats. No, I didn't make a donation. You, you gave them you gave them attention, and now you're out here spreading the, the 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 word of what they found as if it's gospel, and it's not. It's fraud. Well, in your opinion, not in my opinion. It's no, no, no. Not just in my opinion. Okay. It, Which, it, in, in in the opinion of all respected scientific experts in this field who have reviewed this, it's fraud. Look, anytime somebody somebody finds evidence of the Bible, okay, it's always it, it's it, it's always brought brought to the the specialists and told how that how stupid it is, okay. Um, yeah, why do you think that is? You know, I, I've. Well, why do you think that is? Do you think there's a global conspiracy to hide the truth of the Bible, or do you think that the scientific community just simply will not accept shitty evidence? I think the scientific scientific community just uh, will will not accept any evidence at all about God. Okay, goodbye, okay. sir. Because it's, you're basically claiming that there's a global conspiracy among all experts and scientists to hide the truth that you and others, with no expertise and no evidence, claim is the truth. That is absolutely ridiculous. Um, it's a waste of time to keep talking as if. There's a global conspiracy to hide the truth of the Bible. Why won't God show up and just fix it right now? Because God, you know, God has God has given us what what He's given us. Okay, and goodbye. I don't need tautologies. When I say why won't God show up and and fix it right now, to say God has given us what He's given us. 
Yep, I agree. God has given us nothing. There is no God in, in evidence to to say that we've been given anything as well. We're going to take Jay right here in Texas. How you doing, Jay? You're on with uh, Jim and Forrest. Hello, Jay. I'm doing good. Happy Easter. How, how about I'm doing good. How about yourself? Doing right, man. mighty fine. So you had a near-death experience that proves uh, the afterlife. Well, it proves that there's something after this consciousness, I think. Just like how... Would you mind telling us why? why? Well, my experience is when um when I when, when I went it was it was all it was just clear and everything and um I saw myself but except myself was was golden and um so, Jay, I had flew back could, in. Could I interrupt you for a second? And yes. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I uh. This may seem rude, and I promise I'm not trying to be, but I, I would like you to explain, before you explain what you saw, or rather rather than explaining what you saw, would you please explain to me why it convinced you that there's something more beyond this life? Because lots of people have had near-death experiences, lots of people have had out-of-body experiences, lots of people have had all these things, and not a single one of them actually gives us any compelling evidence for anything after death. Um, all at the, the very first call, we talked about lucid dreams. We talked about DMT. We talked about chemicals in the brain that cause these hallucinations. We talked about all that stuff earlier. So what I want to understand rather than what you saw, I'm sure what you saw was really, really cool. I too have had cool dreams. Why does it convince you that there's something beyond this life? Why is it that poignant to you? Because it was, um, it was real and I was dead. They had me on life support. I had a full yeah, book lots, lots of people have died and come back from that. And the so, whole, and the whole thing was a, uh, it was like I don't know how to how, how to put it, in the sense of because I may have not been physically feeling it, mm -hmm. but it was it was feeling it, and um, you may not be able to. Uh, I don't know. I guess it's like a, I guess it's like a a, a transition of state. Like from water to gas to solid, from fire right, to right. smoke, from wood to 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 to, to charcoal. Yeah, phase and phases. Got that. it. Yeah. I mean, it, it 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 it's not in that same state, but then again, it was very real as I'm talking to you right now, and as right. The, it, and real, the real question. Of... Sense the real as in feeling, the real as in even yeah. touch. Well, the... The, the problem that I have is the brain is more than capable of taking um, uh, hallucinating things in such a way that they're real, that they seem real. Um, I mean, w there, there, there's uh, the the famous mathematician, uh, was it Graham Nash? His last name is Nash. I think his first name is Graham. Uh, is notorious for this. If you watched uh, Beautiful Mind, um, you know, he thought real people were giving him information about communists and plots and, and acting on it. He thought they were real. Brains are known to do this. Um, so how do you how do you differentiate a brain being a brain and it actually being reality? Or reality being just in your brain well, and actual reality? Well, I've talked to other people who've had these same and some people tell me they just see darkness and um I, I don't know because what what I was doing before my my accident is I lived a pretty um, karma positive life, and the people that I talked to who had this happen kind of did very like unpositive things. And um, okay. so you you think that the people who didn't see anything that isn't evidence for there being nothing the same way as you seeing something is evidence for something. It's evidence for you just being a better person than them. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. I would just say um, maybe. I mean, I. I don't know because. So, so let me ask you this then, because uh, Jim just asked a really pointed question, and I feel like it kind of got skimmed past a little bit. So I'm going to elaborate on just a little bit. Is when I was in college, yeah. I did acid once, right? 
and I, the world got very weird and the back of my couch became a, a living mural of cowboys and Native Americans interacting. And it was very, very you know moving to me to see this. And then I tripped and fell off of my own face at one point. The world was insane. And then I came down and that stopped being the case. So how do I know that my experience wasn't me actually interacting with another dimension beyond our own, and it wasn't actually me seeing beyond the fabric of our reality and all the, or I was high. How do you know that your experience was this other plane of existence rather than your brain was deprived of oxygen and it saw weird things? You had a dream. Well, because I really didn't see weird things. Um... When I when it I sounds like you said some weird things. The, 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 well, where the plane was just like the the the, the exact setting and scenery was just like where I was because I had cool. A, I I, had, I I had a dream about same, doing same. dishes once. Does that mean that it was more real because it was just well, no, normal doing no. dishes? No, no, no. Um, my 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 wound was self inflicted, and I woke up in the same place where I was where I did the thing. Yeah, that's fine. And what I'm asking is, I, how do you know that it was anything more than a hallucination? What gives you the reason to believe that this was anything more than just your brain dying and coming up with crazy fantastic? Because right now, you're seeing and hearing and feeling you know, and tasting were, and smelling. Were, These are all processes me, in your brain, right? They were carrying me to the... Um, yeah, but they were... I, I was feeling them carrying me to the medical tent. And them taking okay. off my clothes, cutting it off, and them cutting open my, 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 my side. I like and to sleep with the I, TV I, I, on, and I sometimes I'll have dreams that incorporate what the game grumps are saying on TV. That's how dreams work. You incorporate things from outside your dream all the time. That's not. That's not anything magical. No, no, no. no. no this is what. No, this is what they were doing because that, 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 that's because that's 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 what happened when I, I got a self-inflicted gunshot wound when I was when I was when I was deployed and they, I was mm -hmm. feeling all this, they, they had picked me up and they did all this, they, they had told me this, but then I went back to the place where I fell, which was about a right. 200 yards back. Mm -hmm. And that's where all this stuff happened. And then I had, I had just woken up in, in, in Germany and, um, I thought I was just out for a couple of minutes. So do you, days, but. do you accept the idea? Like, do you think it's true that people can lose time, that they can be in a state yeah. like a fugue state where they lose? Okay. So that is a thing that can happen. I've had dreams. No, no, I'm not, I'm not just talking about dreams. I'm talking about situations where people will lose whole hours, maybe even whole days of their lives and they just don't remember it. Do you think that's a thing that can happen? because yeah. it, it is right <laughs> so yeah it, you you can. have yeah. that can happen it can happen usually in response to trauma right so people can lose track of time people can lose memories people can have hallucinations people can have crazy dreams people can incorporate things in the real world into their hallucinogenic state brains that are deprived of oxygen, people who are dying, people who are suffering, people who are going through a suicide attempt, whatever, do see these crazy things and have these out-of-body experiences. Not one of those things leads to a supernatural claim or, or evidence of a supernatural claim. So you putting them what all together doesn't lead evidence of a supernatural Sorry? What about if it was just a transition, like I told you before, with water to gas to solid from liquid? You would have to then give me evidence that there was something to, to transition to. You would have to give me evidence that there was something to mean? transition to mean? before like, I... Like, 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 do we have to trans transition into, like, another physical being or just another I... link for wavelength? Because waves... You're, you're making like, the like claim. Radio waves exist, right? Sure, but they have yeah, nothing to do with your consciousness. Yeah. But what is but what is consciousness though? It's the emergent property, property of the, the electrical. Feeling, right? Yeah, this is what we just talked about. It's the emergent <laughs> property of the electrochemical activity of your brain. Is the last call we just had. That's a feeling, though, right? That's a feeling, right? Feelings are associated with it, but I wouldn't say consciousness is a feeling. No. But 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 it's something that can be measured, though, right? You can measure it, though, right? Like we could yeah, measure. I wouldn't it. know. I, on, I guess so. Database yeah. Database and everything, right? Right. Sure. Okay, In the same so way, you can talk about. It, like, 
if we can measure it, then we can also like deconstruct it in a way, right? We so again, measure it. I'm going to give you the exact same example I gave the last caller then. The exact same example I just gave the last guy. If I light a candle, there is a flame on the candle. If I blow out the fire, where did it go? Did the fire become something new or did it just stop existing? The chemical reaction that is fire, converting hydrocarbons and oxygen into carbon dioxide and water, stopped. The, the chemical reaction that is your consciousness stopped. No, yeah. It's just like no, the, the fire did not become smoke. The fire did not become smoke. That's not how it is. brought me back. Well, then what is... Yeah, that's, just, that's good, that's without, good, that's good doctors fire, and good medicine. Smoke, right? Yeah, Sorry? But, but 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 see, just like the candle could yeah, but 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 what is um but see just like the candle could be relit, I could be brought back to life. And just like how yeah, my sure. flame went out and turned into smoke, but the smoke could come back because it could the fire could be relit and you can blow out the candle again and the smoke will come back. Right. I, I just want to be very clear. You you I just want to be very clear. There 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 are no units like so when you talk about fire. You're not, it doesn't turn into anything. Fire is a chemical reaction. It's converting hydrocarbons and oxygen into carbon dioxide and water. That is the chemical process of yeah. fire. Yeah. Consciousness is a chemical reaction as well. That, that didn't change into anything else. The reaction stopped. It ceased. And yeah. then you can restart it, to live in but that's all. So when you're yeah, when you the, die, your consciousness bed, stops. Though. You don't transition into anything else because there's nothing to transition into. It is a process, a chemical process that has stopped. There's no next thing. Yeah, but where does the smoke go? Just like consciousness of like a the fire. Consciousness have to stay in the vessel. Smoke is a byproduct yeah, of fire. It is not anything to do with the fire itself. Smoke is a byproduct of fire in the same way me writing on a paper is a byproduct of my consciousness. The writing on the paper can't turn yeah, back yeah. into me. But what is the byproduct of your consciousness after you 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 leave your body? Like, where does that go? Where there, there no consciousness smoke? stops. No, we have no reason to believe that it continues. Organic, yeah, the byproduct of my consciousness after I die is this rotting sack of meat that's going to get eaten by bacteria. That's all. Yeah, but we can make humans. Human beings are just elements. They're elements that a kid can buy with his allowance. We can I agree. Make human beings. But why? We, we, why we can't can make, we make one human being though. Why can't we put something in that human being that makes him a human being that we could all say that's a human being that I could talk to? Oh, well, you do. What it's called we DNA. Do? We can physically make one. Yeah, it's, we can it's called make DNA. One, that's what makes right? us human. DNA makes us human. There's it's, nothing yeah, external to us. Human. So if, if, if you're arguing for the concept of a soul, what you need to do is show how a soul interconnects with the neurons and how it interacts with neurons and how it makes neurons fire. Because we know how neurons fire and there's nothing magical about it, right? There's no soul the there. Fire. There's no consciousness there. No, what there's, about there's no the such thing. To create the soul. What we don't think the there is the soul. Would, the, the, then whatever you call a soul happen. created by neurons will die when the neurons die, right? And and we also know this it's because just like, it's just of like the flame and the. Well, so explain how damage to the brain can create a whole new consciousness, a whole new person with a whole different set of uh, EKGs. How That's does that exactly happen with, with brain damage? Create a whole new person. Doesn't yes, it does. Person, yeah. but that yes, it does. Is that brain? That yeah, it, is that brain? if you if you uh, sufficient damage to the brain can create a whole new person with a whole new set of likes, dislikes, and a whole new set of EKGs, whole new person out of it. Well, then that would be probably more of an evidence of consciousness than anything else. Because if it was consciousness, then consciousness comes from the brain. Kind of trauma would yeah. be done. Have you heard of Phineas Gage, Jay? <laughs> oh, yeah. Jay, have you ever heard of a person named Phineas Gage? No. Okay, so Phineas Gage was a guy, is, this is a, a very, very famous case study from every single neurobiology, every single psychology class ever, right? You've got, hang on. You've got in your head... <laughs> 
Here we go with the props. Yay. All right. So on, inside folks. your Wait brain, I know go. we do have some audio listeners, but I'll explain. Okay. Inside your brain, you've got different lobes. You've got different parts of your brain that do different things. This front area right here is called your frontal lobe, right? This is where your personality sits, among a lot of other things. I am oversimplifying here. This part here is where you are, right? This is why a lobotomy, a frontal lobotomy, basically just turns off a person's personality. This part of your brain is really important for decision making. It's really important for ethics and moral thinking. It's really important for deciding what you want to do with your life, actions and consequences. That's all part of this. Phineas Gage was working on a railroad back in the 1800s. He was known for being a very sober, very kind, very rational, very calm, very hardworking person. And he was in a, in a, in a tunnel working on this railroad. There was an explosion and some dynamite went off that wasn't supposed to, and it launched a steel rod straight up through his skull and completely obliterated his frontal lobe. And it was so hot and so fast that it cauterized on the way out. And he was able to get up and walk out of the mine with this giant hole that just blew off half of his brain. And he went to the doctor and the doctor was like, hey, all right, go back to work tomorrow. You know, take some aspirin, walk it off. And he did. And from that day forward, Phineas Gage was violent and cruel and sexually aggressive and mean because it took out this part of the brain that handles that kind of processing of saying, what kind of person do I want to be? Do I want to uh, you know, obey my raw animal instincts or do I want to think a little bit more? This right here is what causes your consciousness. And with Phineas Gage lost a part of it, he became a completely different person. It completely changed who he was. This was the reason why it's such a famous case study is because this is one of the reasons that we learned about different parts of your brain doing different things. The doctors are like, hey, this part of the brain seems to be pretty important for this. And so if we can completely change a person just by changing the structure of this lump of jelly right here, then how can you sit here and say that my consciousness goes on beyond this brain? D did, a, did a part of Phineas Gage go off and become something else and then the rest of it came along with it when he died? Did Phineas Gage soul change? Did his soul fragment? Like, what could you possibly point to that goes beyond the actual physical thing that we see that does everything you're claiming? What is, where does data go in a computer when you get rid of it? It Completely doesn't. question. If you break a computer, the data is no longer there. If you want to get super technical, we can talk about the, the electronic domains and the little magnets of blah, blah, blah. But if you destroy a computer, the data is gone. You can no longer recover it. Well, if like, I blow out a candle, the flame well, is gone. I, you can no longer recover it. If you destroy a brain, a person is gone. You can no longer recover it. But their feeling, though, their, their presence, this like state of um them could be is what that we're saying that's gone it's, it's gone just, yeah well not well how do you say like the, the 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 memories of the people that they came in contact with those are real right well, yeah <laughs> sure those other people's memories are real and then when they die those memories are gone Right. It's like saying if I take a picture of you, you know, and then I have this photo, and if I burn the photograph, where, where did you where go? Did go. It just, it's just like okay, like you know how we have this cloud thing where all our data goes, right? Well, where yeah. what is the data? What is data? What is data? Like, what is that? If I have a thousand pictures on a thing, it's not the same whether I have like a thousand physical copies of a picture, right? It's the exact yeah, same. Have just, thousand, it's yeah. We call no, but, but is yeah, it if, you, if you copy a picture a thousand, a thousand times, paper. you have a thousand copies of it. A thousand yeah, it doesn't matter if it's on a computer or whatever. Like uh, computers are physical things. The cloud is not an ethereal map. The cloud is just the word that we give for a bunch of literal physical servers that actually have more. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Has, so that's how a hard drive works. It's just switching these little domains. Data, right. Yeah, and, and if you destroy that hard drive, the data's gone. And if you put those, yeah, but if you put those all all that terabytes on pieces of paper, it would probably fill up 
warehouses. So what? Uh, what? Space, yeah, right? I, I don't see what you're, you're you're wandering from point to point to point, and you seem to be missing no, no, hours. Which is, is that once you're no, dead? No, 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 what I'm saying is, if you destroy the data, where does that data go? It's gone. It does stops it just, existing. It, yeah, it doesn't. It isn't a thing anymore, man. That, that's the whole point. Matter can't be created or destroyed, but it can change forms. So, you know, yeah. this 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 group of, of atoms here in the shape of a microphone, if I were to change them into a different shape, they would not be a microphone anymore. It wouldn't be a thing. It's 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 the same thing with data, it's the same thing with memories, it's yeah. the same thing with people, same with everything. If you destroy it, it is destroyed. Period. And he dropped. I'm sorry you had a bad dream, Jay. Yeah, same here. It's time to get sexy, so watch Secular Sexuality Live Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash YTSS and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash callsex.